when you're really putting in effort, I think it's, it's shown and other people respect it. What's going on, everybody? Welcome. This is Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio, episode 394. Today, I'm joined by my guest, Master Dylan Nadler. I'm Jeremy Lesniak. I'm your host here for Martial Arts Radio. I'm the founder at Whistlekick. I've been doing martial arts my whole life, and it's, it's kind of my thing. I love training. I love talking to other martial artists. And so I found a way to turn that into my job. And so here we have Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio, the show where I get to talk to amazing people about their martial arts experiences. And along the way, you get to listen in. All for free. We do these shows twice a week. Mondays, we do an interview. Thursdays, we have some kind of topic-driven episode. You can think of it like the difference between a novel and a short story. Thursdays, you know, sometimes we, we talk about things that are bugging me. Or sometimes we have a guest on to talk about a very specific topic. Either way, hopefully you find something in one of the two formats, or maybe even both, that enhances, improves, or just you find enjoyable. If you do get something out of the show, we'd appreciate you showing some love back in some way. You can head on over to whistlekick.com, see all the stuff that we do. And one of the things that we do is we sell some stuff. And if you make a purchase at whistlekick.com, use the code podcast15. That's going to get you 15% off anything we do from uniforms to sparring gear to apparel to, oh, just all kinds of stuff. But we do have our stuff over on Amazon as well, but Amazon chews up a good chunk of the profit. So we're not giving you a discount there, but if it's easier for you, hey, go ahead and do that. Show us some love. Or if you want the free ways to show love, just share an episode or leave us a review or whatever it is that works for you. Whistlekickmartialartsradio.com is the place to go if you want show notes with transcripts, photos, video, links, all kinds of stuff to tell you more about the guests that we bring on or the topics that we have. Whatever it is that might be relevant, it's there. So check it out. I think it's fair to say that everyone that trains gets something out of it. Most of us get different things out of it. We get different benefits for our lives. Martial arts, generally, martial arts makes us better. But the specific ways that martial arts makes us better vary from person to person. Today's guest has taken his time as a competitive martial artist in the sport of taekwondo and turned it into not just a pursuit with his academics, but also a business. And it's given him connection to some pretty amazing people. On today's episode, we hear about how that all started, how it honestly could have gone very differently, very easily, and how it's turned him into the man that he is today. Let's welcome him to the show. Master Nadler, welcome to Whistlecake Martial Arts Radio. Awesome. How are you doing, man? I'm doing great. How are you? I'm fantastic. I'm fantastic. You're one of those folks who has the distinction of living in the Great White North. You're in Canada, but you're actually south of where I live, which I'll, I'll tell you, I remember the first time I saw Toronto on a map and I said, wait a second, how are they south of where I live? That, that's silly. That does it, to, in my brain, that doesn't make sense. But here we are in depending on who you talk to, central or northern Vermont, and it's cold and it's snowing again, and I'm ready for it to be done. Right, you know, it's actually really nice today. It's like nine degrees, well, Celsius, it's like nine degrees, but uh, you never know. That's the crazy thing about living here is like next week it could snow and they could go back to being warm. Like it, it's crazy. So you never know. You can't get too excited. But yeah, no, I think it's been pretty consistent, but it's definitely not what everyone thinks it is. <laughs> no, no, I'm, I'm sure it's not. Um, you know, I, I don't know about you being in the city, but here in the Northeast, we, especially if you're in a rural area, you are familiar with the fifth season, mud season. Mm-hmm. I don't know if you're familiar with mud season. Some of the listeners out there might not know what mud season is, but bottom line, it's when the snow melts and quite a few of our roads, because they're not well traveled, are dirt. And a lot of snow melt on a dirt road creates a lot of mud that you have to drive through and uh, I, I can't see out the back window of my car right now right you get excited because you're like okay I could, I could dress nice now I'm ready to go but then you have to put on you know your bummy shoes because you can't get them all dirty that's right that's right and I 
I've seen, and to bring it full circle, I've seen a lot of people who get really excited depending on the, the martial arts style they train in as they promote, progress, and get to wear black pants so they don't have to have mud around the bottom edge of their pants for those that, <laughs> that don't change when they get to the dojo. The right, dojo. 100%. <laughs> well, I'm impressed that we just found a way to bring weather and mud back to martial arts, but of course, that's not really what we're here to talk about. We're here to talk about you. Yes, sir. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to poke at you. I'm going to ask you questions, and I'm going to start with the most fundamental question that we could possibly ask beyond what's your name, and that's how did you find martial arts? I started martial arts when I was five years old. Um, I started doing Taekwondo. You know, my parents put me in a, in a recreational facility near my house. You know, it was really close by. Sessions were, or classes were a couple times a week. It was really easy. And I had a lot of fun doing it. Um, you know, something that taught me those, those core fundamentals of martial arts that any parent wants for their kids. You know, discipline, focus, self-esteem. And, you know, most importantly, it gave me, it gave me goals, you know, as, as a young kid, you know, I'm talking about five, six, seven years old, you know, just to get your next belt or to get a stripe on your belt. You know, these are goals and aspirations that I think is really hard outside of athletics to kind of focus on that young. So, you know, that's why for me, it really caught my attention. And, you know, I've always been really, really competitive. So that was something for me that really, really caught my eye. Um, you know, as I, as I developed and as I grew and as I aged, you know, I really fell in love with sparring. I really love sparring. Like I said, I'm super competitive. You know, I was pretty athletic and, you know, I had a, a hunger and a certain drive that, you know, I didn't see anywhere else. So that's why, you know, sparring really, really caught my attention. And like I said before, you know, the place I was at was really great for building those fundamentals. But in terms of competitiveness, it wasn't really up there in terms of one of the schools you go to if you want to be an Olympian per se. So, you know, by the time I was about 12 years old, 11, 12, and that passion for sparring really kicked in, you know, it, it came to the point where I had to switch. And, you know, if you've ever had to do that before, it's a, it's a tough call because you're you're kind of transitioning from somewhere you're comfortable with, somewhere where you trust the people involved, somewhere where you've built this connection. And it kind of feels like you're, I don't know, how do you say it? It kind of, it kind of just feels like you're leaving and, it, and it's like a mean thing when in reality, you know, it's about personal growth and, you know, people should feel almost grateful that, you know, you kind of see that for yourself and you look to develop your skills further. So for me, it was a little bit tough to make that decision, but I ended up switching to a different club in, in Markham, Ontario called Authentic Taekwondo. And I heard about Authentic Taekwondo through my, uh, through the coach that was actually my headmaster and he had a lot of connections in the industry. So for him to kind of provide a list of places to check off was really, really amazing of him to do, especially because he was essentially kind of, you know, shipping me somewhere else. So for him to provide, you know, a few names for me to check out, was something that you know I'll be forever grateful for. Um, you know, I'll, I'll I'll never forget my first day walking into Authentic. It was my first. It was my first kind of club on the list. You know, I had a list of about five, six places to to take a look in the area, and that was my first one. And you know, I'll never forget sitting there um, talking to the to the headmaster, Master Akmal Farah, and he was just going through kind of you know what they what they're about. You know, what their goals are, who they've who they've established, and different people, and and just the whole kind of everything about it um and then i walked in and, and i sat down and watched part of the class I, i'll never forget too i had a, I had a broken hand already from a tournament i went to a couple months before so i was sitting there in the corner with my parents with a with a cast on my hand and i was just kind of taking it in and i'll never forget i uh, it was one of the masters who was teaching class and he was he had all the athletes facing the mirror and he was saying okay watch yourself when you kick and watch what you do before Right. See if you can see yourself, how it looks to your opponent and see if you can, you know, change it or see if you can hide it or make it sneaky. Right. Look at your opponent and see them as their shoulders. Right. When their shoulders turn a little bit after you fake, for example, then, you know, they're going to throw a back kick. Right. If they kind of turn their shoulders forward, you know, you can see they're going to attack. And for me that, you know, never had any sort of let's say brain power in the sport. I was always just kick, 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 punch, 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 like no strategy, just kind of kill mentality with no formal training behind it. To see that was like, holy crap, you know, this is, this is crazy. And, you know, after that, I, I didn't have to go anywhere else. I didn't even look at any other clubs. That was, that was the place for me. And, you know, I, I was there up until, you know, I'm still there teaching, but, you know, I just started, I just stopped, sorry, competing, you know, at a, at a high level about a couple of years ago. But, you know, I was, I trained there from when I was 12 up until I was about 18, 19 years old. And, you know, from there, that's when everything started to change. 
um, you know, I was I was a black belt already going into it, but my skills were nowhere near black belt in terms of, of of competing. You know, and I think that's a problem that you know a lot of kind of martial arts clubs face is kind of the abundance of giving out belts and stuff like that. And I knew all the all the curriculum and I knew everything that the black belt should know, but it's a different world, the competition side and the recreational side. So I really had to adjust to that. And I really had to, you know, learn from my teammates and learn from my coaches. And luckily I had a lot of national champions there. Uh, one of the one of the coaches, Master Dominique Bossart, was the first Olympian from Canada to win a medal at the Olympics for Taekwondo. So that was amazing. And, you know, I just had so many role models to look up to. Um, and yeah, you know, I could, I'll answer, I guess, specific questions that you have about training. It's such, yeah. a, vague, such a vague question. Oh my God. Yeah. But, and, uh, and, yeah. and it's supposed to be, right? Because, you know, one of the things that we love about this show that I love about this show is that people are encouraged to kind of go off into the weeds and to talk about the things that are important to them, because that's a reflection of you, of your story as a martial artist. You know, mm-hmm. we, don't, we don't necessarily follow the same rigorous format with every guest and that's that's intentional you know we have some that you know we we ask the that first question you know how'd you get started in the martial arts and next thing we know it's 45 minutes later and we've covered a ton of different things <laughs> and i think that that's important because when we look at martial arts as martial artists we're all very different you know you talk about your time in taekwondo as being an athlete that competitive side Whereas I'm sure there are plenty of people listening who are thinking, you know, I've, I've never really thought of myself as an, as an athlete or folks that maybe just a little more bluntly don't enjoy competition. And that's okay because martial arts provides us the opportunities, regardless of what we're passionate about within martial arts, to express that. And that's why martial arts resonates so strongly for me is that diversity, that openness to connect. 100%. And I, yeah, I'd love to talk more about the competition side. Yeah. So, you know, if we go way back early on, it sounds like despite being at a school where competition wasn't a focus, you found something in competition, in sparring that really clicked for you. How, how did you how did you connect those dots? So that's a good question. You know, the place that I was at, we didn't really spar often. I would say maybe once or twice a year. And for me, you know, I looked forward to it so much. And, you know, unfortunately, the other kids that were with me didn't. So that's, I think, why we didn't do it as much. But, you know, I went to a tournament one time because they kind of just posted the, the poster somewhere in the dojang. And I showed up and I was all excited. And it turned out that no one else showed up. Like my, my masters didn't show up, any teammates. So what happened or what ended up happening was that my dad had to come down and sit in the coaching chair and try to coach me. But he had his foot he, or he had the, the camera between his legs trying to record me at the same time. And it was just a mess. But, you know, I still loved it. And even though I lost and even though, you know, there was nothing technical about it, it just it just made me excited. And that's how I knew that, you know what, this is this is for me. And after that, everything else seemed boring, you know, going through the patterns and going through, you know, all the other things that traditional martial artists do. You know, even though I knew them, it, it just didn't give me that fire that I learned from from fighting and competing. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And then um, so. So what happened is when I went to Authentic Taekwondo for the very first time, it was in January of about 2011. And as soon as I showed up, you know, they were were preparing to send their athletes off to nationals in Winnipeg. And for me, that was crazy because these kids were my age. Like they were literally like my age, if not a year younger, a year older. So to see these these people my age heading to nationals in, in Winnipeg, that means they're going on a plane, they're staying in a hotel, they're going to a different province to represent Ontario. For me, like that just opened my eyes. And I was like, wow, this this is going to be me. This is what I want. I want to be a part of this team. I want to have the Team Ontario jackets. I want to know the cheers. I want to represent you know, something bigger than myself. So, you know, that's when I really, th- that first kind of goal came into my mind of, okay, I want to go to nationals. So I spent that whole year training really, really hard. You know, we went to local local games, you know, every month. So when I say local games, I mean, you know, a club hosts it and they're all over Ontario. So anywhere from, you know, Kitchener, Waterloo to like Ottawa to um, Kingston, Ontario, like these are just different places in Ontario, but Ontario is really, really big. So, you know, sometimes you have to drive like two, three hours to get to a different tournament. And we were doing this every month and we were just going for, for fun. They're just local games or just for fun, but, you know, trying to develop those skills. And at the very end in August was uh, our provincial games. So I guess that's something similar to like a state championships down there in the States, but we had a provincial games and 
the way provincials work is that if you come top three, then you make Team Ontario. So you get to go to nationals. So that was my goal. I was like, okay, provincials is coming up. It's close by. I need to do this. I need to perform because I want to go to nationals that were going to be in, in Vancouver. And up until that point, you know, I only won maybe like two or three of the local tournaments that I went to. You no, know, I did pretty well because I had a lot of um, like energy and a lot of passion and the technical skills kind of followed behind me. But I only won a couple. So going to provincials, I wouldn't say that the odds were on my side, but I really, really wanted it. So I went to that provincial games and I was just on fire. You know, I remember being in the zone and even though I was only 13 years old, you know, I was, I was going nuts. So I actually won that. I won that tournament. I won gold and, you know, I, I earned my spot to be on team Ontario and to go to nationals that were going to be in Vancouver all the way across the country in January that same year. So I worked even harder. I kept training and, you know, I got to kind of fulfill that dream of going across the country, completely across the country, all the way to Vancouver to compete at my very first national championships. And I went there and, and I won gold there too. So for me, that was, that was a crazy time of basically knowing nothing in terms of how to compete and the technical side of competing and winning provincials, winning nationals, all when I was in the eighth grade. So that kind of kicked off a whole career of, of, uh, like competitiveness and a whole career of just that competition aspect that, you know, has never left me and that, you know, it, it's taken me to so many places around the world, so many different events. And, uh, you know, I think that was a huge marker in where I am today. Mm. And you're talking about traveling around the world. So I, I'm, I'm guessing that, you know, you didn't, you didn't stop it at some Canada nationals, you know, you, you, you kept going. So, Keep going with the story. Where where has has Taekwondo taken you outside of Canada? Sure. So you know the nice thing about Taekwondo is that it's so international, it's so worldwide, and there's tournaments everywhere. And the way that it works for competition is that you know if a tournament has an open class rating, for example, you know a G1, then that means that you can get ranking points. And ranking points, are, are you you kind of work towards your world ranking. So it's more important for seniors. So, you know, once you're like 18 plus in the senior division, world ranking becomes more important. But, you know, the whole point is that these events matter a lot because, you know, they track your results. They're all measured. And these are things that can really help you grow. So I remember right after that nationals actually in Vancouver, about a month later in February, we were off to Vegas for the U S open. And that was crazy for me too now because I'm, I'm 12 years old, 13 years old, just came off a nice win at nationals in Vancouver and I'm off to Vegas, right? How many, how many eighth graders can, can tell their friends, Hey, I'm going to Las Vegas to fight in a tournament. It was crazy. So I went to Vegas for that. And what happened in Vegas? I, I came, I won my first. Oh, so the funny thing about that is that the way it works in tournaments for Taekwondo, at least is that you can't do headshots unless you're a certain age. And I, I think that age, it, it's always changing, but at the time it was about 14 and I was still 13. So, you know, in Canada, we never did that. I was still only body shots. But when we went to Vegas, they just changed the rules and it was a little bit different in the States. So that actually was my first tournament using headshots. And US Open is a really, really big tournament, one of the biggest tournaments in North America. So it was kind of intimidating because, you know, there's a huge difference between just throwing to the body and throwing to the head in any sport, whether it's kicking or punching or anything. It's a whole different, whole different game. So I remember being super intimidated going into there. But it was a really good event. You know, I won my first match, uh, and then I won my second, and then I lost to the third. So I think I finished somewhere in like the quarters or round of 16 or something like that. But for me, I was really, really proud of myself because I was able to go out, perform, and just feel really good about what I was doing. Um, and, you know, to capitalize on, on the places I've been, you know, I've been everywhere from, you know, Canada, USA to Spain, Belgium, Dubai, um, Korea, Taiwan. Uh, where else this so many places mexico germany like all over europe asia south america it's just it's been an amazing it's been an amazing journey so well said so powerful and i think even though you articulated it as taekwondo being so global martial arts really is global and while we we do you know things different ways and and Olympic Taekwondo probably has the best standardization in terms of competition rules because of the path up to the Olympics. Uh, we might see that change with karate, 
course. Mm -hmm. Um, But I think it's fascinating when people talk about their international adventures. And, you know, we've had folks on the show who have traveled to other countries where they didn't speak the language, but they were able to train and they were able to understand each other through the, I mean, maybe it's hokey to say this, but the language of martial arts. And I just, I find that so fascinating. I haven't trained in in another country. I'm I'm thinking back. No, I have not trained in another country as much as I would like to. Uh, But just, just such great stuff. Mm -hmm. You know, I think it's funny that you say that the language of martial arts, I think you can be even more vague than that. And to say the language of effort, you know, I think when you're really putting in effort, I think it's, it's shown and other people respect it. So regardless of if there's a language barrier or what country you're in, if, if those people see, Hey, this guy's really trying, it motivates everyone. And you don't need language to motivate someone, right? You just need energy. You need passion. You need your voice to be loud as opposed to articulative, right? So I think, you know, that, that language of, of effort and passion is something that expands into everything. Absolutely. Yeah. If you've been in a a martial arts class where a new student visits or a a new student starts, you know, and everybody kind of steps their game up a little bit, you know, puts their best foot forward or at the very least doesn't want to look like a fool. You know, there that's effort. That's more effort. That's additional energy being contributed back to the group. Mm hundred percent. And, you know, it's funny, you know, our coach will say sometimes to, to the little kids, listen, yell, you know, this is the only place that you can yell. You can't go home and yell. You can't go to school and yell. So, you know, take advantage, let this energy out and, you know, just, just have fun while, while you're doing it. You know, you can't kick your friends at recess. You can't kick your dog at home. So have fun, you know, sparring and doing all these things that, you know, just, just take advantage of it. That's right. Absolutely. You know, here on the show, we talk a lot about stories. You know, you gave us a little bit of your origin story. And I'm sure you've got more stories. So if I was to ask you for your favorite story from your time training, what would that be? That's a good question. You know, like I said before, I've been to so many different places and, you know, so many different experiences. And, you know, I think there's one that, that stands out. It's just something that's really funny. So I went to, uh, I went to Korea. I went to Korea twice, actually. So Korea is the origin, the origin place of Taekwondo. So they have, you know, professional teams. You can actually get a PhD in Taekwondo in Korea. You know, they have like Samsung teams and, and it's ridiculous. Like over there, it's, it's the real deal. So I went there because I had a really big tournament coming up. Uh, it was the Youth Olympic Game Qualification Tournament for Canada. So basically what that means is the Youth Olympic Games 2014 in Nanjing, China. So for that to happen, you need to qualify. So there was a qualification tournament in Taipei. But in order to qualify for the qualification tournament, you have to make Team Canada. So, you know, out of all the athletes in Canada and all the divisions, only three divisions could go through. So it was a little bit based off ranking points, a little bit based off of uh, a couple other things, but primarily ranking points. But the first thing that you had to do was was make Team Canada. So that was a huge tournament for me. So that was in that was a going to be in November. So before that, for that summer leading into it, you know, we were thinking, what could we do? You know, how can I prepare myself? So there were always options to go to Korea with, with a different group. So my coach said, okay, you know, I'll send you guys off. So he sent me and my teammate off to Korea, which was a crazy experience. You know, we were the only ones there that didn't have our coach. You know, there was about maybe 20 athletes from Canada, but we were the only two without our coach there. Um, and I was, I was 13 years old. So, you know, to go to Korea, which is like a 13 hour flight, 13 hour time difference. Uh, the conditions were terrible. Like we were staying our beds, we were in like bunk beds and there were like dead bugs in the crevices of the bed. And it was like 40 degrees Celsius and there was no air conditioning, no nothing. And it was just like, we were in the trenches. Like I, I, all of my mental toughness really came from that, you know, especially as a, as a 13 year old kid where, you know, your friends are, are at home playing video games and, you know, going for lunch and doing, you know, fun things like that. You know, I was in Korea really just going through the hardest times of my life. And I think it's really funny because there's a, there's a story where we had a, a drill where we had to run up, run up a mountain. So it started off kind of flat and it, and it really kind of upped the angle as you ran. It was about 200 meters. So we had to do it five times. So we had to run up the, run up the mountain five times and it was really, really tough. Now, on the fourth try, one of the other masters who was there was kind of trying to show off. You know, he brought his training gear. He's like, okay, okay, let me, let me try this one. So he did it once, and he went up the mountain, and then he, he ended up puking and throwing up. So, you know, I think it's a funny story just to show that it doesn't matter where you come from or what your experience is. You know, hard work is hard work. And, um, you know, that's just something that 
it's just it's just funny because you know it was it was it's i think it just shows how crazy it was and how intense it was uh you know another example of of korea too there's a lot of funny korea stories is so we go up to our to our room and you know it was me and my two teammates this time this was the next year and we walk into the room and it was just hardwood floor a pillow a blanket and a box of frosted flakes and they basically said okay guys you know good luck and there were no beds there was nothing it was just hardwood floor blanket pillow and frosted flakes and they said okay and i think that just set the tone from day one as oh my god you know this is this is it we're back we chose to be here i don't know why we came back but you know this is how it is and you know it's it's just those stories that really shape you into who you are and you know make sure that when you come home you bring that intensity back you know whether i was the only one to go to korea or have my my two teammates you know we made sure to come back and and bring that intensity and show our teammates hey you know you have it easy over here right let's step this game up let's let's make sure that we're catching up to to the other programs in the world because you know we need to do more and i think that's one of the best things about traveling and experiencing new things is that you really get exposed to different programs out there and if you if you don't travel you'll never know so we're able to come back and say, okay, you know, we thought we were pushing it. There's a whole other world out there. You know, we need to step it up even more. Mm. Now, what, what's it like staying in a room that's just so, so bare? And, and, and I'm going to skip the interesting choice of Frosted Flakes as, as <laughs> to being food that they threw you. But, you know, what, what's it like to go from, you know, a bed and comfort into your training versus really having nothing, I'm assuming nothing but your training. It's interesting, man. Uh, you know, for lack of better words, it's, it's like prison. It really is. You, you know, we're, we're spending all this time there and we were training about three times a day and the trainings were about two hours and we would go, you know, just, just to go from the training facility to where we ate lunch, it was like 2000 stairs. So, you know, we were always training, whether we were just going to eat and, you know, let's not even get started about the food, right? The food was, was something else that we never experienced before, right? We thought we, we went up to the cafeteria and we're like, oh, okay, lasagna. And it was kimchi and we're like, oh, wow. So, you know, especially as little kids, you know, we, we really had a lot to, to learn. So, you know, to be in a room like that, to be in a place like that so far from home, it just, it gives you nothing but focus and, you know, the days seem way longer, you know, the hours seem way longer, the weeks seem way longer. We were there for about two weeks and it just kind of strips you of everything that you knew and forces you to rebuild, but stronger, you know, you don't have distractions. You can't just kind of go on your phone and scroll through Instagram or Facebook and you can't really call your family because they're sleeping when you're awake. You know, you can't do any, there's not even air conditioning. You can't even lie back comfortably. So we basically just spent the time in the room either just laughing with each other or, you know, counting the hours until the next training. Because by the time we got back to the room, we, are, we only had a certain amount of time. So it was basically just counting the hours. You know, sometimes we just sit outside of the facility because it wasn't worth us climbing back up the mountain to go back to the room. We were just like, you know what, I don't have the energy. I'm just going to sit here outside and wait for the next session. So, you know, when, at least I feel for me, when I was in that type of, of atmosphere, it just, it rebuilt everything but rebuilt it with a much stronger foundation. And it made me realize that, you know what, I'm a lot more resilient than I thought. And, you know, if I'm capable of doing this, then, you know, what else am I capable of doing, right? If I can withstand some of the harshest conditions ever, right, then what's stopping me from, from really digging deep and building that relationship with myself when I need to compete? You know, I say this all the time, but I think the, the strongest relationship that you have is that with yourself. And the only way to build it is through adversity. So, you know, experiencing adversity and going through those, that kind of trauma, you know, really establish that relationship with myself where I believed in myself and I believe that, you know what, I can do this. I just did it. Now, how am I, what's a, what's a test for school? You know, I came back and I was in high school. I'm like, how am I, how are people worried about exams? You know what I mean? Like that's nothing. Or, you know, girlfriend breaks up with you or friends. You're like, this is not even that big of a deal. You know, I was just dying in Korea. You know, it was 40 degrees. I couldn't sleep. There were bugs everywhere. Like this is nothing. So I think it just reshapes your perspective on life. Mm. Yeah, and for folks out there who who can't do the math, uh, forty degrees is is uh, seventy a hundred at a hundred degrees Fahrenheit. And we're talking like <laughs> midnight too, like nighttime yeah. when you think it should be cold. Yeah, you know, I reflect back on my my first black belt test because it was presented to me in this way that that you're speaking of now. This idea that you've been able to work through something so challenging that other things just pale in comparison and if you can get through that you can get through this 
so were there any times other than, you know, kind of the, the vague examples you gave of a test or friends or a girlfriend, where you really took a step back and said, this is nothing, or this is so much less than what I've already been through? Mm, I think... I think it really just applies to the vagueness. I think, you know, for me, even when I came back, I was training still three times a day. So I'd come back, even in, in Toronto, I'd wake up uh, early. I'd, I'd have a training session from like seven to eight in the morning. And this was this was just with the, the core group. So me and a few of my teammates, we were all in high school at the time, like grade 10. So we'd wake up early, go to training from seven to eight. And then our coach, he would drive us all to school. So he, he would, and we, we went to different schools. So he would drive across the city, dropping us off at school. And then afterwards, when we were done, you know, our parents would drop us back off at the club at, you know, 3 p.m. And we'd train from 3 to 5. And then after that, we'd have, you know, a couple hours to eat, do our homework, do all of that, and then go down for the regular schedule training at night from like 7 to 9. So we were training a lot. And, you know, it's easy to, to get in the habit of complaining, to get in the habit of feeling like, wow, this isn't fair or why me? Or, you know, I really just want to go see a movie tonight. I don't want to train. I've already trained twice. So, you know those really big experiences of that kind of, you know, maximization of what trauma is and adversity, it makes you appreciate even those smaller ones more of, you know what, at least there's air conditioning. At least I can understand my coach. At least I get to go home and sleep after this. So even on a scale of training, you know, it, it really helped. And, you know, on a scale of personal life, um, you know, especially, you know, I was, I was still in high school, so I, I can't really relate to maybe bigger problems. Cause for me, you know, when you're in high school, school is one of the biggest concerns for tests and exams and, you know, people freak out and, you know, they stay up all night and, you know, they have anxiety attacks. So for me to see my friends and my peers, you know, freaking out over tests and projects for me, it was kind of funny. I was like, wow, like, you know, this is, uh, I, I just couldn't relate. You know, I couldn't relate to that, to that stress because I've, I felt at least I felt, Know, the real stress and, and and real adversity so for me a test was was nothing i was like you know what i could i could do this no problem We're, that doesn't mean i was a great student but just i think the mentality of just taking the test or doing the assignment was like okay this is definitely not impossible so i think it translated into a couple of different ways mm. yeah yeah i can i can totally see that when when you talked about you know again we'll go back to the beginning when we talked about you finding sparring and finding competition and really taking some joy in that and wanting to dedicate some time to it. I imagine that who you were then versus who you were when you went to Korea versus who you were when you came back and even went again the second time and again now, you know, there's, there's got to be some difference in there because people only tolerate hardship for so long without reward or benefit or a shift in mindset. So yeah. what is it that's kept you going over these years and, and through this, you know, three a day trainings and stuff like that? It's just, it's a sense of confidence and it's a sense of security. You know, you come back from something like that or, or even just throughout the career. And the thing about martial arts is that you're constantly testing yourself, right? Whether you're just training at the club and, you know, you're trying to remember your pattern or you're doing some light sparring or you're doing a test or you're halfway across the world fighting someone, you know, in a competition, you know, there's, you're always testing yourself. And for me, I figured, Hey, if I'm always testing myself, I need to be, you know, the best version of myself. So that's why I was reading more and I was kind of, and I, and I was watching videos and I was just doing everything I could to be the best version of myself because I knew, Hey, you know, I'm doing something where I'm constantly testing myself. I'm always in kind of the international eye. There's always people watching. There's always people, you know, listening and learning. And, you know, how can I make sure that every time I go out and perform, I'm doing it to the best of my ability. So that's another way that these experiences have kind of changed me. And and after all that, just giving me a different approach on life in terms of just being a lot more just cool, calm, and collected. You know, I don't get bothered really easily. You know, I, I don't stress a lot. And, you know, that's not necessarily me being special. That's just what I've learned from martial arts, you know, because before I was, I was a regular kid. The only thing that made me different, I would think is, is that extra kind of drive and passion. But other than that, everything was normal. So for me and, and going through these experiences, you know, I think whether I take this in my life at work, at school, at home, it, I just have a different outlook at, you know, at the end of the day, things aren't that bad, you know, regardless of how big something may seem, how many problems there are, it's not that bad. And, you know, I can get over it. And I think that realization does a lot for just mental health in general. You know, me realizing that, you know what, regardless of what's happening, I can get over it. I'm okay. I've been through worse. It's, it's a settling feeling 
that gives me confidence going into new situations because I know that I can embrace them and I've done it before and I've probably, you know, gone through worse than whatever I'm about to do. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, I can see that. All right. Let's switch gears a little bit. So you've had the chance to travel and train and had a bunch of different instructors. And, and I imagine that if we think of all the different people you've trained with, even on a peer level, it's a pretty long list. Mm-hmm. But let's, let's flip that list. Who would you want to put on it? Who haven't you trained with that you would like to? That's a good question. I think I, I, think I have a pretty interesting answer. I think I have an interesting answer. So for me, what I would love is I would love to train with my masters at their peak. I think that's a different spin on things. Okay. I think, uh, you know, for me, I've kind of had the opportunity to, uh, to I've sparred, I've competed against Olympians. I've competed against Olympic champions. I've competed against world champions. Like for me, I kind of lost that star quality when I look at them because it, it's my job to be competitive. You know what I mean? So I never really looked at anyone and said, oh my gosh, you know, I really would love to meet you because, you know, as, a, as an athlete, as a competitor, you can't do that, right? If you're in the NBA, you can't really look at LeBron James and get his autograph because, you know, you want to beat him in the game. So for me, it, it was always hard for me to, to look at it like that. So if I'm talking about training with anyone, I would love to train with, with my coaches and, and those people that really helped me get there. Like I said before, Dominique Bossart, first Olympian for Canada, you know, my head coach, Master Akma Fera, you know, multi-time uh, world championship competitor, you know, multi-time national champion. Uh, you know, these are people that I've looked up to, you know, Master Ali Gafour, he, uh, same thing, world championship competitor, national champion, and he even runs a a business right now where he's creating a new form of chess cards for competitors. So almost like a, a new e chess card that uses pressure as opposed to points. So he's really changing the game as well. So for me to to take these people that have helped me grow and, and have been beating me up when in their thirties and forties, you know, to, to have the chance to train with them at their peak, I think would be something that I would never forget. Mm. What do you think that experience would do for your opinion of them? I mean, the, the, the benefit to training is obvious, right? But I think most of us have had, maybe even all of, all of us, have had some moment where we come to, to learn more about someone. You know, we get some insight into who they are or who they used to be or, or something like that that gives us broader context. And quite often that is positive, unfortunately, if we're looking at it on you know, on the, on the news or in, in media today, it is usually presented as negative. But as you, ha- as you imagine this theoretical universe where you get to train with those folks at their peak, how do you think that would change your relationship? There we go. That's what I'm asking. How mm-hmm. would that change your relationship with them? So that's a good question. You know, I think and another kind of perspective I can offer from the competitive side is that these relationships that I have with my coaches we're already very different than, you know, what someone else would expect in the martial arts world. You know, there's still, you know, you bow every time you see them and you say, hello, sir. Hello, ma'am. We had that very formal relationship, but, you know, since I was always traveling and, and it took, as opposed to a master student, it was also a coach athlete relationship. So I really got to experience a different type of relationship with my coaches that, you know, most martial artists wouldn't in a, in a personal level, you know, the, the things we've been through. So, you know, I'm already grateful that I've got to experience more of a personal level with them. I think through that training, through that, that sparring them at their peak, like you just said, you know, I, there's an interesting thing that, that one of my coaches always says is that, you know, you can tell a lot about a person through how they are in the ring or, you know, the way that a person fights is how they are in real life. And, you know, I think an example of that is, you know, are you timid? Is someone really hesitant? Are they confident? Are they rambunctious? Are they, you know, and there's so many levels to it. So, I think I would reverse it and say, I know how my, my, my mentors are in life. So I would love for that to be translated into the ring, right? I know the passion that they have. I know the experience that they have. So as opposed to what could I learn from them or how, how would the relationship grow? It's more, how would that relationship translate into the match? Because I already know them on that level and I know, you know, what they're worth and what their value is. So to see that translate into how they fight and into how they would perform is something that, you know, I would, I would just love to see. And I think that relationship through fighting is something that's amazing. You know, fighting is one of the only sports where once you're done, you know, you can't really complain because you fought them, right? It's not like you lose in, in swimming and now I want to fight the guy I lost to because I'm mad, right? That 
the competition was the fight. So you can't really, there's nothing left to prove. And I think that's why, whether it's martial arts in a, in, in a traditional sense or it's MMA, like UFC and stuff like that, you really see the competitors after they're done, they have a different respect for each other. You know, they really hug it out. They, they express their gratitude. And I think that's something unique about martial arts is that you're testing it, you know, live on site against another human being. And at the end of the day, once it's done, you kind of see who is better. And that's something that you can really only get from martial arts because you're going, you know, one-on-one -on -one with that other person. There's nothing in the middle. So, you know, to experience that and to, to build that fighting relationship is something that I think would be fantastic. As my original instructors used to say, there's no politics in a knockout. <laughs> there, we, can, we can complain all we want, but as the rules start to fall away, there's, a, there's something inherently objective as you get there. A hundred percent. We've talked a lot about you know, your perspective on, on life, as it, especially as it relates to martial arts. And I want to shift gears a little bit. And I want to talk more about some of, some of the fun things, some of the things that make you tick. You know, uh, you know what, what are you doing when you're not training? So for me, so, you know, I, I stopped competing at a competitive level, like I said, a couple of years ago. And that was just because, you know, I was already in university. Um, you know, I had a lot of things to do and, you know, I got to the point where I had to really look and say, okay, you know, what is my goal? How close am I to achieving it? And what am I about to risk to get there? And it was a really tough conversation I had to have with myself, but, you know, at the end of the day, I decided, okay, I need to take a step back from this, but what else can I do? So, you know, I still teach classes, you know, once a week with my, with my uh, original club to, uh, to, you know, to just to give back to the community and, you know, to kind of pass on that knowledge that they've given me and to give it to, to the youth. So, you know, what I'm doing right now is I'm, I'm still in school, I'm pursuing psychology, and I actually just created a, a sports psychology program last year called MindLock, where, you know, I work with athletes to, to do exactly like I just said, to, to work on their mental game, you know, throughout the whole process of being an athlete, talking to other athletes, traveling the world, you know, I've really gotten a sense to learn how much of a mental game it really is, right? Because when you get to the Olympics, for example, you know, between the gold and silver medalists, they're both going to be strong. They're both going to be fast. You know, they're both going to be persistent. So what's it come down to? Because someone has to win, right? It comes to that mental ability. Who's more confident? Did someone hesitate? Who's more committed, right? These are the mental things, right? Did someone choke and get nervous? How do you respond with the crowd cheering? It comes down to all those other things that you wouldn't think about unless it really impacted you. So for me, you know, and, and the mental game has really been one of my, my strong points because like I said before, there's nothing really special about me when I was growing up. You know, I was never the tallest. I was never the fastest, never the strongest, but you know, I made sure to really work hard and I made sure to study my opponents. You know, I had a whole binder of, you know, all the different competitors that I would have going into a tournament and I'd watch tapes and I, and I, I'd pick them apart. I'd say, okay, what leg are they going to hit? Are they going to strike with when they're in this stance? Okay. How are they going to counter when I attack like this? All the things from that all the way down to, okay, how can I make them tick? How can I frustrate them? What's something that's going to really bother them when I'm fighting them? So I would really, really study my opponents and break them down and use the mental side as a tool, just as important as my kicks and my punches and my stamina were. You know, I made sure that my mental toughness and my mental preparation were one of my strongest tools. And I really, really believe that. And I really believe that it's you know one of, if not the most important thing in terms of competitiveness and athletic, athleticism in, in any level. So you know I really worked towards you know providing athletes with that providing athletes with the tools they need to you know, consistently hit that that high level of performance regardless of anything that's going on hmm. now i i'm not going to poke at you for being younger and doing stuff i think a lot of times people will do that and i think that that's ridiculous but you are starting something with with launching this program that most people your age aren't doing mm -hmm. so tell me I'm, I'm I'm attempting to ask the question in a way that is not disrespectful because I definitely don't mean it that way. It's okay. I'm good. Yeah. Here's the way I, some people would ask the question. Sure. Why do you think you have the tools at your age to be able to help people? Here's what I want to twist that into. Perfect. Yeah, 100%. So how you know, are you, how is what you're doing different? Because I, I, I firmly believe in business. Every disadvantage can be flipped. Sure. What's the disadvantage? The disadvantage here, unfortunately, is that you're younger. But the 100%. advantage is that you haven't been necessarily corrupted or indoctrinated into 
quote unquote, what's possible. So what is it that's different with what you're doing that other programs out there might not be doing? For sure. So, you know, like I said before, I've always been competitive, you know, whether it's in training or competition or, or even in life. And I comp- that competitiveness is kind of carried with me. So, you know, I've had sports psychologists, I've had therapists, I've had everything. And it's funny, but always in the back of my head is, you know, if and when I were to do this, how could I do it better? And that's always been in the back of my head. So for me, I've always been, you know, kind of taking tips and, and learning things and making sure that I can capitalize off my experience because I really believe that, you know, where I've come from and, and what I've been through is, is really unique and something that other athletes can appreciate. So for me, when, when I was in the process of developing this program, I thought, okay, what do I have that other people don't have? And for me, it's really that in-sport, high-level experience. You know, I've been national team. I've been national team captain. I've traveled the world. I fought at that Youth Olympic Games qualification tournament in Taipei. You know, I've been through all the ups and downs that I know, at least when I spoke to a sports psychologist, is that, okay, I really believe that they understand in terms of an academic level, right? They've read the books. They understand some solutions on how to solve stress and how to solve nervousness. But I didn't get the feeling that they've been there. And for me, it was always that missing piece of, okay, it's one thing to read it in a book, but it's another thing to experience it. It's another thing to experience walking out to the ring in a country where that country's fans are cheering against you when you're going to fight them with their referees and, you know, feeling that pressure, feeling that, that, anxiety. And, you know, I really feel that that experience, that sport experience really helps me connect with my athletes because, you know, a lot of times they go through things that you can't read, right? Things like weight cut, right? A lot of my, my fighters, because I work with different, it's not just fighting. I work with, you know, I have a, I have athletes in, in the UFC, athletes in Bellator, athletes in the CFL. Um, but, you know, for me, for fighting is something I can always relate to on a different level. So when an athlete is cutting weight, so, you know, they have a tournament coming up, they have to lose weight. They're going through all these, all these issues, whether it's physical, mental, emotional, you know, that's something that I can really relate to because I had to cut weight. You know what I mean? I've had tournaments where I had three weeks to lose 20 something pounds and I was already really scrawny. So I know what it feels like to wake up with no energy to, to, to know how it feels when your body is using protein for energy instead of carbs because you haven't given it carbs in two weeks. So, you know, it's those little, little things that I think make a difference. And, you know, most importantly, uh, it's, it's the applied method. You know, for me, whenever I went to these therapists or these psychologists, I always thought, you know what, it's so great that they're listening to me and that I'm going to them, but it would be even more amazing if sometimes they come to me. You know, I, I really like that I'm sitting in the office and I'm explaining myself to them, but I'm kind of giving them a sense of who I am. But, you know, I feel like the only thing missing is that I would really want them to to make their own opinions, to develop their own opinions on what I'm doing, what I look like, right? If they could come to training or my competition, that's something that would be amazing. And I knew that that wasn't really possible. Like, who's going to do that? Who's going to, what psychologist or therapist is going to take time out of their day to, to drive to, to watch me train? You know, it doesn't make sense. They're not going to go to a competition, right? It, it, it's just not realistic. So for me, I thought, you know what, that's going to be a staple of what I do. I really want to make this applied. I really want my athletes to feel like I do care and that I'm giving them everything that I have in order to make them better and that's something that i'm implementing you know i go to training sessions and not only do i watch and learn and say okay you know how is john how does john look when he's warming up right okay if he feels good and he's warming up and he's smiling and he's laughing then that means he's feeling really loose so now if i go to the competition and i see that he's doing that i say great john feels good he's ready to perform but if john for example is kind of tense and he's not really talking to people the way that he did in training when he felt great now i can say okay red alert now what's going on? How come he's a little bit more held back or something's going on? Let me go figure it out and let's make sure that this doesn't impact performance. I think that's something that's really, really important and and it takes it to a different level. So for me, it's always about not only having that athletic experience to back what I'm doing, but it's, it's really caring and, and, being more applied and knowing that, okay, I'm going to conduct these training evaluations and not just watch, but also, you know, give back. So, you know, I'll work with the coaches and say, okay, you know, put them under, three situations that put them under high stress. So maybe they are losing with one minute left. They have to get three points. Maybe they're winning and they have to defend the lead, right? Put them under pressure situations and I'll analyze, I'll assess and see what they're doing. How are they responding? You know, how is the stress level impacting them at different stages? And I think that's something that you're not going to get from anywhere is that, is that deeper level of applied methodology is not just saying, okay, you're telling me that you're stressed. Here's my three solutions. It's okay. Through watching you, 
this is how you respond to this pressure. This is how you respond to that. And let's work it. it. It's much more personalized. And I always knew that when I was competing, I loved things being personalized because I knew that what I was doing was different. And I knew that as an athlete, everyone's different. So for me, the more personalized and the more detailed it could be, the more I fell in love with it. So, you know, I take it from an athlete perspective. You know, I, I kind of run this program from the athlete perspective with the knowledge that I have now. And I think it, it blends together to create something that that's amazing. Tell us more where people can find this. Like, I, I think you sent me some links, but for people listening, where, where are they going to find more about this program? Sure. Yeah. So you can check out our website. It's mindlock.org. So M-I-N-D-L-O-C-K, mindlock.org. You know, I have a, an Instagram page at mindlock with an underscore after that. Um, and, you know, you can message me at any time. You can, you can email me at Dylan S. Nadler at gmail.com. And, you know, these are, I, I'm always, I'm always around. I'm always, you know, engaging with people with, with comments and, and with likes and posts. So I'm always around, you know, you can get some more information from the website, from the Instagram page, you know, send me a message. I can always give out a, a program outline, which I love doing. And, you know, I'm just always open to, to communicating. You know, like I said before, you know, in the short year that I've been doing this, I'm already working with athletes at, you know, a UFC caliber, Bellator, CFL. So, you know, I'm, I'm really grinding and I'm really trying to make sure that I expand this as fast as I can, but most importantly, that the quality never changes. You know, I would, I would much prefer to do this at a slower pace and keep the quality than to try to rush it and, you know, kind of spread myself too thin. So I really feel like, you know, the timeline is looking really good and, you know, I'm always open to, to working with more athletes and, you know, this is something that gives me passion. This is something that not only can I give back, but it's fun for me because I'm always learning. And I, you know, I'm always challenging myself and my clients. And this is something that, you know, really makes me excited. You know, even after this, as soon as I'm done this with you, I have a session coming up uh, with, a, with a UFC fighter from Florida. So, you know, I do these all over the world. I do this basically through video, video calls. So you don't have to be from Toronto. You don't even have to be from Canada. And I think that's something else that makes this program different is that you don't have to drive to my office because you can do it from home. You can do it from the car. You know, take an hour out of your day and I can run through, you know, a very high quality sports psychology session that you're still getting the worksheets and the activities. And as soon as it's done, I'll just email it to you, right? That way you have it. And this, you know, provides something that is really, really portable, right? I'm working with athletes in Florida, in LA, in Canada, you know, in Milwaukee, all over. And, and this is something that athletes feel really comfortable with because if they have to travel for a competition, they don't have to worry, right? They can, they can call me the day of, the day before, and we can run through a quick session and it doesn't matter because I'm always here, right? It's not like you're, you're always coming to my office and you, you need to book times and drive in the car and kind of take this time out of your day. And then the moment you leave the city for an event, it, you're, you've kind of lost it. I think the fact that you can take it with you is, it, is something else that's really, really kind of special. It's great stuff and stuff that more and more people need, I firmly believe. Anybody that's making martial artists' lives better and better helping them express their passion or, or help them find their way within martial arts, you know, I'm going to support it 100%. And that's part of why I definitely wanted you on the show. I mean, you're, you're doing some great stuff here. So let's flip gears as we start to wind down here. We've talked about the present. We've talked about the past. Let's talk about the future. What are your goals as you move forward, both for MindLock and for your own training, your life, et cetera? So that's a great question. So for me, you know, I hit a really big milestone this year of getting my, my fourth degree black belt and becoming a master. You know, even though I stopped competing at a high level, it was really important for me to, to continue on that path and, and, you know, to be a master and to just kind of solidify all the words that I've been putting in on the traditional side. Because I think sometimes as competitive athletes, you lose sight of the origin, you lose sight of the tradition and you lose sight that, you know what, this is a sport. This is an event, but at the end of the day, it's a martial art. So it was really important for me to kind of fulfill that traditional sense and to get that, that fourth degree and become a master. So, you know, you can always build on that and get more degrees, but you know, to me, that fourth was really important. You know, the, the, uh, the ability to, you know, break through the, the concrete and, and have that, that visual is something that was really important to me in terms of, in terms of business, you know, my goal for, for MindLog is to really just build an empire, you know, as I say, and, you know, if you go to the website or you go to the Instagram page, I, I really believe that this type of training has been kind of kept in the shadows for way too long. You know, I really believe that sports psychology therapy, these are things that aren't in the light. These are things that people don't really post about. People don't really talk about if they're doing it, they're doing it, you know, they're kind of keeping it to themselves. You know, my goal is to make this cool, to make it popular, you know, the same way that after you're done a, tra a hard training session, you, know, you put up a picture of you sweating and saying, wow, I just worked so hard. You know, I want you to put up pictures after our, our psychology session and say, wow, you know, I, I felt really good, just had a good talk, had a good session, right? These are things that 
are making you better as an athlete, right? The same way that you want to post pictures after training because it shows the world that you are really putting in that grind. It's the same thing with this, right? What a there's no better way to show that you're taking your your fate into your own hands by working on that mental side. You know, the thing I tell my athletes is, you know, think about all the things you're doing on the physical side, right? All the things you're doing to, to better yourself, to develop yourself, right? You're training hard. You have a strict diet. You're going to bed at a certain time. All of these physical things. But can you say you're doing that on the mental side? Can you really, you know, honestly say that you're taking that same authority on your training into the mental side? And, you know, a lot of people say no. I would say most people, if not all. You know, I, I haven't met anyone yet that's taken the same amount, if not more, uh, importance on their mental training than their physical. And that's nothing to do with the athlete. It's just about, you know, what's out there. It's just about, you know, how popular this is. And my goal is to make it popular and, and develop to develop something that is really an empire, something where this becomes uh, a normal thing. You know, if you don't have a, a sports psychologist, or you're not working on your mind, then you feel like, you know, let me go find something because I need to start, right? So my goal for the future is, is to really develop this and to really grow this into something that is multi-sport, multi-country, you know, something that, and, you know, I'll say it again, something that's just an empire, something that, you know, when people think of sports psychology, they think of mind lock and they think of the quality that goes into, into training. Great, great stuff. And I look forward to checking it out more. And folks, don't forget, if you're driving or on a treadmill or something like that, and you're listening to this and you're thinking, hey, I didn't jot down any of that, you can head on over to whistlekickmartialartsradio.com. We'll have the links for everything that we've talked about today. And as we finish wrapping up here, I'd love to ask you one more thing. And I've got a feeling that you've got some good stuff for us being everything we just heard about from you and, and all of this motivational, fundamental psychology. I'm, I'm, not, I'm not finding a good collective term uh, <laughs> effort that you're putting in to, to help people and ultimately help the world. And I appreciate that. I think that's fantastic. So given all of that, what parting words would you have for the folks listening today? You know what? That's a great question. You know, what I would say to anyone listening is that, you know, nothing is impossible but I really want to, I, I really want to focus on it because I think it's said so often that it can become a cliche. And when things are cliches, you kind of, you know, jump over them and, and it loses its value. So I would say, find a way to make that possible for you. Find a way to, to take that statement and make it work for you. You know, if there's anything that I said that I think is the most important from today is that I didn't come from anything special. You know, like I said, I was never the tallest. I was never the, the fastest, the strongest, but I had that effort. And I knew that no matter what, no one's going to work harder than me. And you don't need anything for that. You don't need anything for effort, right? There's, a, there's a, an Olympian who just won gold in Rio for Taekwondo who's from uh, Ivory Coast. And there's videos of, of him training on the concrete in, uh, in, in Africa. You know what I mean? So you don't need a fancy facility. You don't even need raw talent, right? And, and this, regardless of if you're a martial artist, business, school, life, anything, you know, as long as you're willing to put in the effort, you know, good things will happen. You know, there's always opportunities falling around you. You just have to reach out and grab it. And, you know, I really believe that nothing is ever going to really fall into your hands or nothing of value. So if you really want something big, you have to reach out and grab it. And, and this is something that, you know, you need to be doing. I feel like there's a lot of excuses of whether it's age or, or, or anything like that, right? You could think of, of a whole bunch of, of excuses for anything. But at the end of the day, you know, what I think is that as long as you're willing, it, you can make it happen. You know, you can, you can make it happen. And even for this, you know, an example and, and a really small example is that, you know, I even reached out to you to be on this podcast because I saw what you were doing. You know, I really liked the audience that you had. I, you know, I saw the quality of, of, you know, shows that you were putting on. And I thought, you know what, this would be a great place for me to offer my take, not just to, to enrich your listeners, but, you know, to give the people that follow me, you know, a good place to check in on other things. So, you know, but I had to come to you, you know what I mean? A lot of people could say, oh, well, it's kind of embarrassing. What if they say no, or what if they're busy? But for me, I don't care. You know what I mean? What's the worst case scenario? And I think this comes back to, like I said before, my training experience of just being a, a kind of cool, calm guy of what's the worst case scenario? You say no. Okay, that's fine. You know, I still tried. So I think even on, on, on a small level, you know, this is, is an example of just trying and, and seeing what happens. You know, the worst case scenario is that nothing happens. And, and that would have been the result if you didn't try. So, you know, on parting words, I would definitely say, you know, not only is anything possible, but, you know, everything is possible. And, you know, all these great things that you see around you were developed by somebody. So instead of thinking about what they had that you don't have, think about how you can create something that, you know, people down the line are going to say, wow, that, that's some amazing stuff. If there's one thing that martial artists 
who have been training a while know and seem to know across the board, regardless of your style and experience, it's how to overcome. Whether we're overcoming something small in our training or something larger in our training, something outside of training that we use our training to facilitate. There's a lot of overcoming. There's a lot of growth that happens within martial arts. And Master Nadler is taking that experience, that growth, and helping others do exactly the same thing. And I applaud him for that. Thank you for coming on the show. Thank you for your time. And I wish you nothing but success. I hope you'll all check out his website. We have links to that, social media, and a bunch more at whistlekickmartialartsradio.com. Remember, this is episode 394. And if you want to find more about us here at Whistlekick, the best places are whistlekick.com and the social media at Whistlekick. It's all over the place. If you want to share some commentary privately or maybe give some feedback, you can email me, jeremy at whistlekick.com. I love hearing from you. I appreciate everyone's support. All the love that you show helps me get up in the morning and do this show, which honestly is a lot of work. Thank you for that. Until next time, train hard, smile, and have a great day. 